Welcome to the museum. I think we have a lot of other people who are on their way. I understand traffic is really bad, um, but you all made it. Thank you for getting here nice on time. Uh, we are going to start the program, and hopefully they will be able to join us in the middle of this really important film and then the discussion following our film. Of course, as I think most of you probably know, that we are holding tonight's program on World Refugee Day today. Um, but this program for us is really has a special significance because it's bringing together two very important strands of the museum's educational efforts. One is our initiative to bring Holocaust education to a global audience, but especially to the Middle East and Iran where there's widespread misinformation about the Holocaust, Holocaust denial and distortion, and of course, anti-Semitism. The other strand of our work is our ongoing effort to educate the public about the crimes against humanity perpetrated by the Assad regime on its own civilians, about which we have done most recently uh, with our small but powerful exhibition based on the story of Mansour Omari, which is now on view through September, uh, through September 4th. I hope you all have a chance to see it. It has really, this small exhibit has really reached very far, been visited by a lot of important officials, including all the members of the UN Security Council that came together to view it. The film will premiere tonight, also brought together two wonderful museum partners, Mansour Amari, of course, who I mentioned, who came to us not only with his own remarkable personal story, but with the precious cloths bearing the names of 82 victims. And Maziar Bahari, who has his own story of imprisonment and torture, in his case, by the Iranian regime. For the past few years, Maziar has worked closely with the museum to bring stories from the Holocaust to the Iranian public. It's wonderful to be able to say that the museum brings extraordinary individuals like this together, and we're very proud that Maziar and Mansour met through the museum and then worked together on this project where they tried to tell an even larger story to a larger audience. And that's the film that you're going to see tonight, the fruits of their partnership with each other and with the museum. You are the very first to will see this film, which will eventually be available online in English, Arabic, Farsi, and German. Unfortunately, Mansour could not be with us, but after the screening, there will be a panel discussion with Maziar, with our friend and colleague, Rafif Jouejate, the director of the Foundation to Restore Equality and Education in Syria, and this discussion will be facilitated by another close friend and partner, Rob Satloff, the executive director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. But now it's time to watch the film. Thank you. Great privilege to be able to moderate uh, this discussion. Um, uh, I've spent much of the last 15 years working on trying to normalize uh, the idea of uh, uh, thinking and talking about the Holocaust in Arab and Muslim societies. And this is such a powerful and compelling uh, film that does just that. And so before we begin, please join me in a round of applause for Mazia. I want to welcome everyone who has uh, joined us on live stream. Um, I think that people around the world are watching this film. Uh, you're all joining in this fantastic world premiere of uh, 82 Names. Um, I want to urge you to tweet out everything that you want about this evening. Uh, hashtag Syria, hashtag USHMM, um, uh, and if you want to create your own hashtag, that, uh, that encapsulates um, what lesson you take away from this discussion or from this film, please go ahead and do that. Let me introduce um, the 
my colleagues here on the on the on the podium, you heard the voice. So now you get to uh, you now you get to see him. Uh, first on my left, um, Mazyar Bahari. Uh, Mazyar, among his many claims to fame, was the first Muslim filmmaker to make a movie about the Holocaust. Uh, Mazyar made the film The Voyage of the St. Louis in 1994. It was part of a, of a Holocaust Museum pro, uh, program. A positive film about the Holocaust. I'm sure there are Muslims who've made film denying the Holocaust. <laughs> if you, if you, didn't, you didn't quite hear what, what Mazyar said, he says he's sure that there are Muslims who made films about denying the Holocaust, but he's the first film to embrace the actual history of the Holocaust. Um, in 2007, Mazia stressed the importance of having this piece, that film, included in a retrospective of his films at the Amsterdam Documentary Film Festival to demonstrate that not all Iranians agreed with then President Ahmadinejad and his Holocaust denial, his anti Semitism, his anti Zionism. While Mazyar was arrested in Iran while covering the 2009 elections, Newsweek if I recall, um, his interrogator used his statements against the regime and his film on the St. Louis, the story of the boat that was turned away, against him, calling him therefore naturally a Zionist sympathizer. Mazyar was imprisoned for 118 days 107 of which were in solitary confinement. So you have a certain regrettable personal connection with the stories we just saw on the film about Syria. Mazir now runs a news and media website that he helped found called iranwire.com. I urge you to take a look at it. Through its website and Facebook page, Iranwire connects with six and a half million people every month. Since making the link with the museum two years ago, the museum has co-produced two films for an Iranian audience and has received extensive coverage of its statement around Iran's second Holocaust cartoon contest and exhibition that was held in 2016. In all these instances, Mazyar has promoted the museum's material through iranwire.com, allowing access to this history to Iranians who may not otherwise be exposed to it. So that's really quite an amazing sense of commitment to spreading Holocaust understanding and using it as a way to break down the barriers to freedom and liberty in your home country. So, congratulations. Sitting on Mazyar's left is Rafif Joujati. Rafif, also a great friend of this museum, serves as director of the Foundation to Restore Equality and Education in Syria. If you put that acronym together, it's Free Syria. And has served as a spokesperson for the local coordination committees in Syria, for the formal opposition during peace talks, and for the Syrian women's political movement. She is currently chair of the board of directors of Beitna, Syria, our house, Syria, a civil society hub organization. And I'm really delighted that you're on this program along with Mazyar. All right, so what we're going to do is I get to ask Mazyar and Rafif, some questions, and then um, in a little while, I'll turn to you for your questions. You can see that there are two microphones in either aisle, and at some point I'll ask people to come up and offer their questions. But now, let me first turn to Mazyar and Rafif. Look, there's obviously contemporary relevance to this story, contemporary relevance in what's going on in Syria, and even some contemporary relevance to discussion here in America today about when is it appropriate to use the Holocaust as a lens through which to see what is going on. Now, you made this film, 
and you made a bridge between Mansoor's horrific experience and his journey through the sites of the Holocaust to help him understand it, to put it into context. Why the link between his experience in Syria in the last decade and the experience of the Holocaust 70 years ago? Uh, well, I didn't build a bridge. Mansour brought those five pieces of cloth to the museum, and there is an exhibition in the museum. And actually, it was interesting because when I was watching the film, uh, and if you watch the film or if other people watch the film in other locations, they do not have the opportunity to go upstairs and see those pieces of cloth themselves. But here you can just go two floors up and see the pieces of cloth. So Mansour uh, created that bridge himself. Why he chose uh, the Holocaust Museum to uh, not donate the film, but loan the, the pieces of cloth to the museum was because of the professionalism of the museum, because of the reputation of the museum, and also, I think, because of the historical relevance of the museum, and not only the historical relevance of the museum, but also the fact that the museum looks at, the Holocaust Museum looks at contemporary issues and other genocides besides the Holocaust. As people know and as I think you can see here, there are exhibitions about Darfur, about uh, Cambodia, about Rwanda, and you know the museum has issued statements about the recent genocide of the Muslims in Myanmar, for example. So Mansour, I think he felt comfortable to build that bridge himself, and I was just there to uh, film it, in a sense. But for me, the story of Mansour was interesting, and the work that the museum is doing is interesting because of this uh, modern relevance. I did not want to have any kind of overt messages in the film, but I think if anyone has half a brain, they would see that there are messages all over the film, and they can just see the relevance of what Mansour says and what Irene Weiss, the Holocaust survivor, says, and whatever other people say in the film, it resonates with the situation in this country, of course, in Europe, in Syria, in other countries in the Middle East, and around the world. And the fact that, unfortunately, we have not learned the lessons of the Holocaust. And this museum is necessary to exist, and it's necessary to, for the museum to continue its work and educate more people in order for people to understand the tragedy of the Holocaust, but also learn the lessons of the Holocaust. So that's why I thought Mansour's story, and, the, and also what we say in the film, the fact that an Arab collaborating with the Holocaust Museum, as you know, as you know, it's a courageous act. I mean, uh, Tad is here, and you're going to meet Tad soon. Uh, last year, we wanted to bring a group of uh, Arabs from different countries to be in front of the camera and visit the museum. We could not find a single person to do that because people are sympathetic behind the camera, but when it comes to showing their faces and claiming their support for the plight of Jews, they do not want to do that because they're afraid of the stigma back home, they're afraid of the safety of their families, they do not want to be trolled on social media, for example, they do not want to be called Zionists, Jew lovers, etc. So for me, what Mansour did was really courageous, and I thought it's a very important story to document. It, it, is Rafif? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to add to that just a little bit. Um, where we have points in common um, are from the movie directly. You saw, you saw that Mansour was uh, referencing the VDC, the Violations Documentation Center. And that organization is a civil society organization that operates in secret inside Syria. They have documented that there are more than 250,000 political prisoners in Syria today. Many of them are underground. The other linkage is with the local coordination committees in Syria, which was a sister organization 
to the VDC, and I worked for them. And part of our job was documenting atrocities and other crimes against humanity. And so the linkage is in a joint mission, a common mission, to expose atrocities and crimes against humanity and bring perpetrators to justice. And just because Mazin Darwish, the director of the Center for Freedom of Expression um, and Media was highlighted, I would like to just honor his counterpart, Razan Zetune, who was the head of the LCC who was kidnapped in uh, 2013 and we still don't know anything about her whereabouts. Just a shout out to her. Um, just to follow this theme, one question. Uh, were you surprised at Mansoor's answer when you asked him what he knew about the Holocaust from his experience growing up in, uh, in Syria? I was not surprised with the content of his answer. I was surprised that uh, he answered the question in front of the camera and he allowed us to film it. Otherwise, I've been to the Middle East, I've been to different countries, and I know the reality there. And uh, unfortunately, that is the uh, situation in the Middle East. But as I said before, it's Mansoor courage that he addresses this issue. That was very important and surprising to me, really. Hopefully, um, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a terrible way to have to appreciate the enormity of crime against humanity, uh, to, to, but to put the, the horrific experience of Syrians in the last decade in the context of the Holocaust is actually quite legitimate. It, crime against humanity on the most massive scale. Um, which re actually brings me to what I want to ask you about, Rafif, which is about uh, trauma and about um, uh, 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 the psychological impact of the, um, uh, the extreme um, violations that we saw a glimpses, uh, we saw glimpses of in this film, but obviously it just scratches the surface. Um, um, uh, what, is the, what is the impact of this beyond the immediate? Um, uh, and how have you seen that play out in, in Syrians all over the world? But the extent of trauma, I think, cannot possibly be described in just a few words. I mean, for, for one thing, you have uh, half of a population, exactly half of a pre-war population that has been displaced. Uh, some are refugees, you saw the statistics in the film, uh, but more have been displaced forcibly sometimes, repeatedly inside Syria. These people are destitute. Uh, the psychological trauma of children waking up to bombardments, of people surviving chemical weapons attacks, uh, like one of my cousins who is now a refugee in Sweden. Um, there are numerous instances, uh, women, women activists who went out in the streets to demonstrate in the early days of the revolution were often subjected to gang rape in the streets, and that was the regime's way of sending a message to families, keep your girls at home. There were a lot of uh, anecdotal stories uh, about different forms of sexualized torture that have been well documented uh, as part of our historical fact basis. Uh, the trauma cannot be overstated. Um, when you live day to day not knowing if you're going to survive the next five minutes, this is traumatic. When you've been experiencing this for seven years, it's devastating. Master, as a filmmaker, how do you decide what is enough trauma to project to the audience the depth of the horror, but yet not so much that it is voyeuristic or <laughs> beyond the pale so that people turn away and don't appreciate exactly what you're trying to do. How do you find that right line? Well, um, it comes with common sense to a certain degree, I guess. Uh, you just try you know, your best judgment, and sometimes I'm sure I'm wrong. But also, I have a group of people that I trust, and some people that I don't know, and I usually show the film to 
them and see their reaction. And so if it's too much, th sometimes I cut out certain parts of the film. But going back to what Rafif said, I think the trauma can really ruin a nation and really gnaws the nation from inside if it's not addressed, if you do not talk about it, if you do not document it. Of course, in Syria, the concept of disappearance is all over the place. People just disappear. You're one day home, next day you're not around. People don't know whether you're arrested, you're dead, you're in hospital, you've just disappeared. And as in the case of Mansour, a year later you appear again. What goes on within that year, yeah, that's nothing documented. And of course, there are so many people who are dead and disappear that way. And when these uh, traumas, they're not documented, when uh, there is no real help for these traumas that are suffered by the nation, there is no way to document it. I think it will have long-term consequences. And then add to that coming to another country, being stigmatized in a new country, being treated as dirt in some countries. That adds to your trauma and you know the psychological effect of it. And I think we haven't seen the really the consequences of what Assad regime has done to its people yet. Coming from Iran, I know that you know the trauma that people uh, of Iran suffered in the 1980s the period immediately after the revolution and during the eight-year war in Iraq, I don't think it's, uh, we can compare to what the Syrians have suffered. But still, it's something that the government doesn't want to talk about. There was a massacre in Iran in 1988 that almost 5,000 people, 5,000 uh, political prisoners were killed and the government doesn't want to talk about it. And people have, have recently started to talk about it. And you can see the effect of that uh, killing that happened 30 years ago now and the trauma, the long-term consequences of trauma that they're suffering. So I think uh, what Mansour is saying and doing and what other people are saying and doing in terms of documenting it, uh, the atrocities in order to confront it is very important and it has to be done as soon as possible. Now, Rafif, you've done a, um, uh, a survey which is available on the Holocaust Museum's website that looks at Syrian attitudes, attitudes of Syrians from around the world um, toward the international community, toward their own future, um, what they hope for down the road in Syria. Can you summarize some of the findings? What do Syrians today, after the horrific experience, what do they hope for? Summarize, sure. We've actually done a couple of surveys. Uh, one that is particularly relevant even today is the Freedom Charter. And uh, this, the Syrian Freedom Charter Project surveyed more than 50,000 Syrians across the country in regime-held and opposition-held areas. And it is particularly important because it's the largest survey of its kind. And in the course of asking more than 50,000 Syrians what they want in the future, um, our team from the LCC, from the VDC, uh, from other civil society organizations, our team was subjected to imprisonment if caught. We all knew that any one of us could be executed for simply pronouncing the words freedom charter. Despite the fact that in the survey, not a single question addressed Bashar al-Assad as a war criminal. The results were that overwhelmingly, Syrians want a secular democratic state, a pluralistic state, a state in which people of all faiths and political backgrounds can live peacefully under the rule of law. So this is one major survey and this is one major finding about what Syrians want and this tends to fly in the face of the Assad regime's narrative that it's either his secular regime or ISIS flies in the face, this completely denies it and proves that the Syrian, average Syrian person wants to live in peace in a secular state. The other uh, survey that we conducted in partnership with the museum was to assess Syrians' feelings about 
the current situation and the responsibility, if you will, of the international community. And overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the Syrians we surveyed point the finger very squarely at members of the international community who have paid such lip service to concepts like freedom and human rights and dignity and democracy and did virtually nothing to stop the ongoing massacres throughout Syria. They've done virtually nothing to stop the complete destruction of the country. They've done nothing to stop Russian use of cluster bombs or the Syrian regime's use of chemical weapons or Iranian use of mass detention and massacre and starvation sieges on entire communities. And so I think understandably Syrians are extremely angry with the international community uh, and, and I, I believe they have every right to, to point the finger squarely there. Well, you, you referred to uh, uh, in passing Assad war criminal. So I want to ask you about Mansour's uh, uh, desire for justice and where in your view we stand today on the path toward justice what needs to be done to achieve a measure of justice the very sophisticated nuanced definition of justice that we heard from Mazen in the movie um, where are we on the path to justice I think uh, Rafif is right in terms of saying uh, that Assad regime portrays itself as the only obstacle to uh, the caliphate, the ISIS governance in Syria. I think when you look at people like Mazen, when you look at people like Mansour and others, you see that there is an alternative to the regime and to ISIS in uh, Syria. Of course, people like Mazen and Mansour, they have certain aspirations which they know cannot be attainable, but it's good to have such noble aspirations and such idealistic aspiration than to ask for revenge. I think that's very noble and right to have that. But I don't, I mean, I think Rafif is a better person to ask this question. I think it's in a very nascent stages at the moment. I'm not sure how long the war will be going on in Syria. And until the war is not finished, there cannot be any peace in Syria. Therefore, there cannot be any justice in Syria. So I think uh, the only hope are people like Mazen, like Mansour, and Rafif, and many other Syrians who are not ISIS, and they're not pro-Assad regime. And they are real, they represent real Syrians. I visited Syria many times. Uh, in the past, before the war, uh, in, you know, between 2003 and 2008. And, you know, it's a very peaceful, secular country, and, you know, people are very secular, more secular than many other Arab countries, including Egypt, for example. And, but I think in order to have any kind of justice, the real discussion of justice, you need to have peace in Syria. And I don't know, looking at the actors in Syria now, Iran, uh, Russia, different countries in the region, uh, the West, I don't know how long this is going on and when can peace be achieved. R Rafif, uh, um, resilience is itself a, a certain form of justice, certainly a certain form of resistance. Would you agree? I would, uh, I would most certainly agree that in the Syrian context, resilience is resistance. Uh, resilience in Syria and for Syrians is the ability to remake your life from nothing. It's the ability to swim for miles or walk for days to hostile countries that take you in nonetheless and make a new life for your children. Resilience is grabbing whatever you can and taking your children and going to the next town, knowing that it will be bombarded as well, but doing it anyway. 
Resilience is always seeking safety and shelter, certainly, but resilience is also forming organizations like the Syrian Women's Political Network. It's continuing the work of organizations like the Violation Documentation Center or the Local Coordination Committees or the Day After Association, which implements projects on transitional justice and accountability and prosecution of war criminals. Uh, that is resilience. I think the ultimate case for resilience is in the Syrian motto that you hear through all of our communities in Arabic. It's al sawra mustamirra. And in English, it's very, very simple. It's two words, or it's three words. The revolution continues. And that is the height of resilience and resistance. All right, on that note, we're going to turn to your questions. If I can ask you to come up to uh, one of these uh, microphones, uh, please, you know what's coming next, please make your question in the form of a question. It should end with a question mark, um, not an exclamation point. Uh, please keep it brief. Um, we're going to take uh, two or three right now, and then I'll turn to my panelists. Um, uh, and um, those of you who are on the web, who are watching us, um, you're, you're, you're very welcome to send in your questions, and they will make their way up here to me as well. So, yes, sir, please. If you could uh, just briefly identify yourself when you, when you pose a question. Hey, Robert Solman. Um, my question is, it's understandable why you were arrested, repression and punishment. What's your understanding of why you were released? Excellent question. Yes, sir, on my left. My name is Shihab Kakali. Uh, my question is, 108 million young kids becoming adults in the Middle East, what kind of diplomacy do you think the U.S. and other countries should do to change the narrative attitude about Western ideals and Zionism? Okay, very good. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Zachary Abunayme, and my main question has to do with uh, a recent pull from the Civil uh, UN Human Rights Council and the impact that will have in our future. Okay, very good. So let's first start with the personal. Um, we know why you were jailed. Why were you released? Uh, well, the film is not about me, so I don't think that I'm going to talk about myself. So, uh, but Mansoor, I think uh, the, the main question Why was about Mansoor, Mansoor. Well, that is the insecurity of the situation in Syria that Mazen was talking about in the film, that Mansoor was disappeared. So the reason for the, his disappearance was because he was documenting atrocities in Syria. And he disappeared with 12 other people. Some of them, they're still in prison. And some of them, uh, who knows, they were killed. And I'm not sure about that group of 12 people, but the larger uh, group of people that they were in prison. So uh, some of them uh, are still in prison. Some of them have been killed. Mansour actually was going through the names of the 82 people that he documented. And he was telling me that he knows for, the fa for a fact that 15 of them were killed, for example, or five of them were released. So it's just that the insecurity that the regime in Syria and other regimes, they try to establish for the citizens, that you're always afraid of what the regime can do for you. And also, the, uh, one thing that the Iranians have really taught Syrians in the past few years is that intimidation goes a longer way than brutality. I heard it from one Syrian uh, prisoner that he was in prison for maybe a year or so, and he said that we, uh, about six, seven months into his imprisonment, he heard people speaking Arabic with Persian uh, accents. And he said, all of a sudden things changed in prison because before they were in communal cells and they were tortured, of course, brutally, but they would go back to their cells and they would help each other, they would talk to each other, and it would be a better situation for them. When those Persian accents appeared or heard in prison by them, all of a sudden they were in solitary confinement, they were not in communal cells, the torture became more psychological rather than physical. 
And I think that is what the uh, Assad regime is really learning from the Iranians as well, that you have to really frighten your people and you have to really manipulate them psychologically. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but this is, this is what I'm hearing from Syrians who've had dealings with Iranians in the past few years. Fascinating. Rafif? Yes, I would agree. I would agree that fear is really the cornerstone of any authoritarian dictatorship. Uh, fear is what allowed the Assad regime to perpetuate Holocaust denial or perpetuate the notion that we were, or the reality that we were always at war with Israel. Fear of an enemy, uh, always fear, fear of reprisal if you spoke out against the government. Fear of reprisal if you spoke out against a Ba'ath Party member. Uh, fear of arrest, of detention, of torture. Every Syrian alive knows about the massacres in 1982 in the city of Hama. Uh, there was an uprising in Hama. The uh, regime, the father of Bashar al-Assad, Hafez al-Assad, decided that it was a Muslim Brotherhood uprising, and that justified him killing as many as 40,000 people within, what, two weeks. And so fear of a repeat of that has been a cornerstone of this regime. And in fact, fear is what prevented Syrians from rising up before 2011. And I think as you accurately captured in the, in the film, it was seeing movements and uprisings in other parts of the Arab world that inspired Syrians to say, well, if they can do this in Tunisia, if it can happen in Egypt, we can do it here. Fear, but always fear. Um, the, the question about uh, um, what to do in terms of uh, um, uh, 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 correcting um, uh, long-held misconceptions about Jews or Israel, um, is it now commonplace or is it more common the view that Mansour expressed that now I realize that what I was taught as a kid was propaganda and that there's a world out there that I'm learning more about and I can see that the horrific thing that happened to me, I now understand that uh, horrific things happened uh, to the Jewish people and to others. Is that a, a more common view today? Well, do you think? Uh, I think after the uh, advent of uh, digital technology, the internet, satellite technology, people have been more in touch with the rest of the world in every country. And as a result, they're receiving more information uh, from different countries. So I asked Mansour actually this question, and according to him, same thing that I saw in Iran is that people, they, the more skeptical they become of their own governments, the more open they become to the rest of the world. And as a result, according to Mansour, uh, people are more educated about issues like the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, racism, and other modern, uh, you know, uh, subjects such as human rights, women's rights, equality, and you know, voting rights, things like that. So I think uh, people are becoming better citizens. And I, one of the reasons for the Arab Spring was that, that's the fact that, and we saw that in Iran as well in 2009, that uh, where is my rights as citizens of this country? You know, the main uh, slogan in Iran in 2009 was that, where is my vote? And that meant, where are my rights as citizens of this country? And that's what we saw in different countries during the Arab Spring as well. I would say it was the the, the fact of exposing the lie, I, I think, is what propelled this, this beginning of the unlearning process, if you will. <coughs> uh, I know I certainly was raised to fear, to fear Israel, to fear Israelis. I, I knew that the Jews were coming after us. I, this was a common uh, dinner table conversation, right? It was the enemy. And we have had to unlearn, just as we've had to unlearn the regime's propaganda. So this is a, a very long process, I think, f and it has to be continued, and I think we, we manage the process through education, through events like these, 
through more films like these, through increased awareness. I can tell you when, when I was first invited to collaborate with the museum on the, our second survey, um, one of my hesitations was, what does this mean for me politically? What does this mean for me socially? What does this mean for me personally? What do I need to overcome? And I had to sit back and, and really take a good look at what I was being asked to do and the value it would contribute to exposure of atrocities, of prevention of atrocities, of lessons learned for future communities that go through this kind of thing. And I think it's an extremely enriching experience and I think that we can all work together to keep the education going and keep the dialogue going. Very good, very good. All right, l l let's move to our next set of questions. If there are additional questions, yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> my name is Brandon Monson from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, my question is, so the United States has a political blockade in place that makes it impossible to commit to long-term wars or nation building. Uh, that being said, how does Syria accomplish the secular democratic society that they want and deserve? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I was, I was actually hoping to learn a bit more about the 82 names. And I was thinking, well, maybe you couldn't talk about them in the film for security reasons, that it might um, injure these people's families or whatever. But I was interested in learning about, okay, who are these people? Okay, very good. Thank you. And yes, please go ahead. Um, my name is Samantha Carlin. I'm currently editing a book by Malik Tarbush, a um, photographer from Syria. Uh, and I was just wondering, um, he's also mentioned that Syrian women have been really pivotal, um, but that's glazed over often. So I, I was wondering a little bit more about the women's political network and how they functioned, what's going on, wh where's the future there, and leading peace. Thanks. Okay, very good. So l let's begin with the 82 names. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we could talk about certain people in, uh, among the 82 names, but we decided not to uh, elaborate on the, the people on the list because Mansour is representative of the people on the list. And also Yazan, the young man that you see at the end of the film, is another person who could be on the 82 names. I think the fact that uh, you know, who these people are, what are their backgrounds, where are they from, is not as important as Mansour's courage in documenting these names and bringing their plight to the attention of the world community. That is why we decided not to elaborate on uh, different people. And also, Mansour was not very comfortable in terms of talking to those people, talking about those people, because we needed to get their permission of their families and themselves. So it was a, a process that he did not feel comfortable. And as you see in the film, Mansour is not totally fine about talking about his experiences. So it was a very sensitive subject to talk about the past. So it was, we, we had to really uh, be careful about talking about the past. Yes. I, I would just like to add that the, these were 82 <coughs> names, and, and I've told you that there are some quarter of a million people documented who are in prison, we, we think. Um, these people are average people. They're not religious radicals. Some of them may be. Some of them may be atheists. Some of them have nothing to do with religion. Some are communists, some are socialists, some are capitalists. They are average people who have chosen to speak out against a dictatorship. They are people who have said, I will march for freedom, or I will stand up for democracy, or I want a state bound by the rule of law. That is their crime. And for that crime, they've been accused of being terrorists, They've been accused of being Islamic fundamentalists. They've been accused of being Mossad spies, like myself. I've been accused of being CIA, Mossad, Islamic jihadist, Muslim brotherhood, Muslim sisterhood. You're, you're I mean, collecting a lot of paychecks. I am collecting a lot of <laughs> <laughs> So you, you see, these are the accusations, right? The punishment is prison or death. 
So those are, those are the 82 names. Those are the hundreds of thousands of names in Syria. Actually, just on this point, I did want to underscore, I thought the movie was very helpful, if you missed it in passing, to, to, um, to clarify uh, uh, hundreds of thousands victims of Assad regime brutality, tens of thousands victims of Islamic State ISIS uh, brutality, um, not, to, not to derogate or belittle the, uh, the victims of ISIS, but to put it in its right proportion. Um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. I think that was very useful. Yeah, and also the difference between ISIS and the Assad regime is that ISIS is very theatrical. They film everything and they put it on YouTube and you can see it. With the Assad regime, they try to hide it as much as possible. With the Hama massacre, for example, I don't think there is a, I think a single photo that's available. Uh, you know, if it was in 1982, so people did not have cell phones or you know, they did not have the even digital cameras to. I, I was in Hama it. about a year after, and I can tell you it was an eerie, eerie, spooky, scary place because nobody would talk about what happened. Exactly. Um, the Women's Network, Rafif. Yes, let's not forget the women because I always say, where are the women? I, I say that in the United States as well when I see all male panels or where I don't see women represented adequately. But in Syria, this is particularly important for me. Um, when the revolution began in 2011, women were definitely at the forefront. Women were the reason the uprising began in Dara. It was when women protested that their sons were imprisoned for having scribbled some graffiti on walls. Women have led, organized and led demonstrations. Women have established pretty much civil society. Women were at the forefront of documenting crimes against humanity. So women had been equal players at pretty much every level in the context of the revolution. As things grew more militarized, as you did have more radicals joining the forces, as ISIS became a force in Syria, women gradually began to lose their rights and become increasingly marginalized. So the Syrian Women's Political Network was formed to give Syrian women a voice at the negotiating table, in the boardroom, at the dinner table, everywhere, uh, ev everywhere, essentially. The political network of, of these Syrian women is not the only organization. There are many, many, many Syrian women's groups now. In fact, there are civil society groups in general that were created as a result of the revolution. Um, to focus specifically on women, we still have a very long way to go but we have been pressuring the Syrian opposition coalition. We now have some representation in the negotiations uh, in Geneva. We have representation um, at all levels of the political opposition. So we, we are making slow but steady progress. Very good. Um, so um, uh, um, the film is now um, about to become available on the web. Tell us how people can urge other people to see this. Uh, I think Tad is going to Oh, Tad's going to do that. this. Okay, yes, yes. great. I don't think that, uh, I think Sarah made a mistake that it's not going to be immediately available on the web. It's going to be toured around the country sometime around the end of September, beginning of October, but Tad can elaborate. On okay, that. so before then we turn to Tad, Please join me first in thanking Reef Ju uh, Rafif Jujati and thanking our fantastic filmmaker. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Pat? Again, thank you again. Um, it's been a very rich evening. I'm Tad Stanky. I direct the International Educational Outreach here at the museum. We've had a very uh, rich uh, evening between the film and the discussion, I would just like to say three things very briefly. First of all, um, we have a very special guest uh, here in the audience that I feel compelled to acknowledge. In the back, we have Irene Weiss, who's the Holocaust survivor who appeared in the film with Mansoor.
thank you, Irene. Irene and Mansoor became fast friends uh, in the permanent uh, exhibit um, and uh, is so helpful to us uh, volunteering her uh, time at, at the museum. Um, so thank you for that. I would also like to recognize that uh, Mansoor, uh, who's, who's not here, unfortunately, who, who wanted to be here but, uh, but couldn't, and thank him for sharing his extraordinary story and his, um, uh, his, his evolution, let's say, his, his journey. Uh, uh, as, as Maziar says in the film, you know, Mansoor is a survivor and now he's a witness. Uh, and how that journey unfolds, Mansoor is in the middle of it. So uh, we're, uh, we're very, uh, very grateful uh, to be working with him. So I wanted to recognize that. Third thing, uh, just to pick up on the distribution of the, of the film, uh, as Maziar said, that uh, this is just the beginning. Uh, so thank you for being here uh, at the beginning. Uh, we are planning to have a screening tour uh, uh, in the US. Uh, we'll also have a, a version in German, as Sarah Bloomfield said, a version in Arabic. So we're hoping for broadcast and for distribution. Ultimately, we would like this film to be seen by as many people uh, as possible. Um, so we'll certainly keep our, our museum friends uh, uh, interested uh, in, in, uh, and hopefully engaged uh, in that um, because the film not only raises awareness about what's going on in Syria, uh, but as everyone has been talking about, also demonstrates the continued relevance about the, about the Holocaust. You know, we often focus on the rise to Nazi power uh, or the mechanisms uh, of the Holocaust in terms of lessons, but there's also the, the aftermath, the importance of documentation and of research and of remembering and of honoring and listening you know, to survivors. And we really see that in, uh, in, in this film. So um, we're looking forward to spreading the film and spreading the word and continuing to um, talk about what's going on today uh, in the context of what we learned from this history. So with that, uh, I'll thank all of you and our panelists again, and um, good evening. <laughs> <laughs>